I love Thanksgiving. I love it for a lot of reasons. Probably the main reason is because I love food. And Thanksgiving, ultimately, if we're just being real, we've made it about food. Food is a big deal. In my house, we love eating. I love Thanksgiving because of the food. But I also love Thanksgiving because it's one of the few times that we get to spend time at the table. Man, table time is a lost art, isn't it? Spending time at the table, just doing life, talking at the table. Man, when I was a kid, every night we used to spend time at the table. My dad would come home from work, my mother would prepare a meal, and at 5.30 she would yell, supper's ready, oh man, we would run to the table. My sister and I would get our places. My dad would always sit there. My mother there. I would sit there. My sister here. And we would hang out, do life, and eat at the table. I remember stories of things that had happened. We would discuss when we were at the table. My dad would talk about his day. My mother would ask how our day was. Was it a good day? Was it a bad day? But we talked at the table. I remember crying at the table. I remember laughing at the table. I was sitting at the table one New Year's Eve when I got the call that my grandfather had passed away. Things happen at the table. And in our house with our girls when they were young, every day, same thing, Linda would be home, I would come home from work, she would have the table ready, and we would sit down and do life at the table. One of the things that we used to do when the girls were young, Linda would play a game with the girls. It was called high-low. And Linda would ask them, what was the high for the day and what was your low for the day? And the girls would proceed to tell her the best thing that happened that day, and they were young, so, hey, what was your best thing? It might have been, I got an A on my report card, or the low might have been, Bobby tried to kiss me. doesn't matter what it was. It was something that we played. But the point is, man, we would do life at the table. And as I thought about it, I thought, man, the table reminds me of the church. Because the church is a place where people come to get fed. Let me say it again. The church is like a table. It's a place where people come to get fed. And throughout scripture, there are these metaphors talking about the table. In Psalm 23, 5, David said, you prepare a table before me. You anoint me with oil. My cup overflows. He's talking about the table. And then if you fast forward to the New Testament, Jesus is talking about what he did with his disciples. Man, they were at the table, but they were reclining at the table. Can you imagine eating like this for Thanksgiving dinner? Wouldn't that be great? You're reclining at the table. That's what they were doing at the Last Supper. They were reclining. Pass the stuffing, honey. Over here, they were reclining. And then in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, it says for those of us that are full tilt followers of Jesus, that we will have a forever feast with Jesus at the table. The church... It's like a table where people come to get fed. And at TE Church, the main course is always the same thing. The side dishes may vary, but the main course is always the same thing. At our church, the main course is always Jesus. Jesus said this in John 6, 35. Read it with me if we can. Take a look. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Who believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus is saying, I am the cosmic carbohydrate. I am the food that fully satisfies. See, I think we're always looking for something to kind of fulfill us, aren't we? We're always hungry. We're, we always have these hunger pangs. And man, what can we do so that we won't be hungry? We're looking for something to fill us up. Many of you think, man, if I had more money, then I wouldn't be hungry. 
If I had a better house, then I wouldn't be hungry. If I only had the right girl. Really? If I only had that boy, oh my gosh, then my life would be complete. Are you kidding me? If I only, if I only, Jesus said, wait a minute, hang on. You're looking in the wrong place. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Jesus is the only thing that fully satisfies the cravings that we have in our life. The church is a table where people come to get fed. And at any church like our church, there are four chairs around the table. And in this chair, at the head of the table, the way God designed it, this is the place for the pastor. And in our church, it's me or Pastor Linda. We sit at the head of the table. I'm the dude with the food. It's my job to serve. In fact, it's an opportunity and a responsibility to serve the food in a creative and a compelling way so that everyone can smell the aroma of the bread of life, want to come into this place and have a meal that will fully satisfy them. It would be remiss of me to serve a half-baked presentation of the gospel. So what we do in our church, why we do it, revolves around this idea that Jesus is the bread of life and we want everyone, no matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, to have an opportunity to come and sit at the table to get full. Now, it's interesting because for, for some of us, we go, well, why do we do what we do at this church? I'm not really sure why we do all of these things. Well, let me put it like this. If Linda and I were to invite you into our home, when you would come, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of use this to compare what happens in this house to our house because this is God's house that Linda and I are ultimately responsible for. But if we invite you to our home, when you roll up, hopefully I'm going to have a place for you to park. And then when you show up and you knock at the door, I'm not going to go, hey, it's open, come on in. I'm going to come and I'm going to open the door for you. We're going to welcome you. We're going to have a cup of coffee ready for you if you'd like that. If you have kids with you, we want to make sure that there's something for your kids to do so that they're not bored out of their skull. We've made arrangements. We've had a conversation with you on the front end. No food allergies. We're not going to serve anything weird so that when you get there, you don't want to eat. And ultimately, prayerfully, you'll come to our home. We'll have a great meal. We'll talk. It'll be a great day. Now, when it comes to the church, we call it from the street to the seat. We are strategic about everything we do because you matter. So that when you roll into this house, man, I hope you didn't have to touch a door today. I hope that somebody opened a door up for you because you matter in this house. That you got a cup of coffee, and if you have kids, I want you to know that what happens in TE Kids, parents, if you aren't taking your kids to TE Kids, man, you are doing them a disservice because what happens up there is life-changing for your kids. It's incredible. It's age-appropriate environments designed specifically for your kids. It will change their life. But the point is, we've got something great for your kids. You're going to come into this room and prayerfully, I'm going to serve you a meal that you go, wow, I get that. That makes sense to me. That's not some exotic meal that I go, whoa, is that thing alive? We want to serve the meal in a way that no matter who you are, whether you've been in church all your life or if it's your first time, you can come in and have an incredible meal. Now, there have been people, overly judgmental religious people, that have said, why do you do all the lights? Why do you do all of that stuff? I mean, aren't you going overboard? Isn't that entertainment? First of all, I would say you need to go back and rewind and check out the temple back in the Old Testament because, wow, did they give God their very best. They didn't hold back anything. And if they would have had it back in the day, they would have had high-def screens. 
They would have had lights. They would have had it because God is worth our very best. And far be it from me to hold back from giving God our very best. Now people say, oh, it's entertainment. What? Man, let me say this. I pray that our church is entertaining. I pray, because if you look back and you look up the word entertainment, the definition means to capture and hold one's attention for an extended period of time. Who was the best entertainer of all time? Who could capture and hold somebody's attention better than Jesus? So if he did it, we should be able to do it. I pray that our church is entertaining and people are drawn to the aroma of the bread of life where they can come and get fully satisfied and never be hungry again. This chair is for Pastor Linda and myself. Now, in every evangelical, biblical, healthy, growing church, there are other chairs. This is chair number one. There should be, in a healthy church, about one-third of the people that are in the church in this chair. And this chair is reserved for people that may be far from God. This chair is reserved for people that go, man, I'm just not sure. I don't know what I believe. I'm not really interested in church. This chair is reserved for people that say, I'm only here because somebody invited me. Maybe I saw something on social media, on Facebook. It looked kind of interesting. Man, I'm going through a difficult time. I'm looking for some answers. This chair is reserved for people that have questions but not yet really consider themselves Christians. And in our church, as long as I am the pastor, this chair, this seat, will always be the seat of honor. Always. This is the seat of honor at this church because this chair matters to Jesus. And this chair matters to us at this church. So if you're here today and you're like, man, I'm just here. Somebody invited me. I'm not sure about this whole thing. I've got some questions. I'm not fully convinced. Let me just say... Everything that we do in our church revolves around you in this chair, and I want to welcome you to the perfect place for imperfect people. We're glad you're here today. I want to serve the meal in a way that chair one, whether they've been in church all their life, de church, never been in church, chair one can go, wow, it makes sense. I'm never going to talk in religious kind of Christianese language just to impress 2% of the people in our church. Never going to do it. In fact, it takes more work for me to serve the food on a shelf where everyone has access. I want to serve the meal in a creative and a compelling way that everyone, including Chair One people, can come and experience the bread of life. So in a healthy church, there should be approximately one third of you here today that are sitting in chair one. And if you're here in chair one, man, we are excited that you're with us. Now, in every biblical growing, healthy, and remember, healthy things grow. In every biblical, healthy, growing church, there's another chair, chair two. And I love chair two because chair two represents people that have moved from chair one. They played musical chairs. They've gone from chair one to chair two, and now they've made a decision for Jesus. Fresh in their faith, man. Fresh in their faith. They maybe just recently raised a hand at the end of a message. Maybe they just said, hey, I, I'm, I'm going to take a step. I don't have it all figured out, but I'm taking a step of faith today. I'm inviting Jesus into my life. I love Chair 2 people because it lets me see what God is doing in our church. That God is on the move at TE Church. And I promise you, let me just say this. If you're Chair 1 today, if you'll just come four weeks in a row, four weeks, I promise you, you will move chairs. You can't stay where you are. You will move chairs. So chair two is awesome. Like last month, we just baptized, I think 20, 25 people, I forget the number, but those are people, yeah, you can clap for that. Those people moved from chair one to chair two and made a public confession 
of Jesus Christ as being the Lord of their life. Now, does this mean that you have it all together, that you're perfect? Heck to the no. It doesn't mean that. But it does mean that Jesus is Lord and now heaven is secure for you. You've made a decision, trusted the work of Christ on the cross. Now Jesus is Lord. You are all in with your faith. That's how I push our chairs in at home. I just kind of kick them if they don't go. Now, in every biblical, healthy, growing church, there's another chair. This is chair number three, man, and I love chair three. Chair three is reserved for spiritually mature people. Now, here's the question when it comes to spiritually mature. Some people go, well, how do I know if I am sitting in chair three? Let me tell you what doesn't represent chair three. Just because you can recite scripture doesn't mean that you're in chair three. Just because you show up to church doesn't always mean that you're in the spiritually mature chair. Here's what constitutes spiritually mature. So you can ask yourself and try to figure out which chair that you're in, but remember, God's plan for you, if you're growing, you're going. So we're always moving chairs. So chair three, ask yourself this. Number one, are you sharing your story? See, everyone in chair three, you've got a story. You've got a story of life change. Man, I was this way. Christ came into my life. I've been, the Bible calls it, born again. It's no longer me, that, but Christ that lives in me. And now you've got a story of who you were, but who you are because of a relationship with Jesus. And when you start to understand this, the mundane will become miraculous. So when you walk into a coffee shop and you're in chair three, you're not simply like looking at people like, oh, they're, they're kind of in my way, they're in line. You're looking at people through a new lens going, wow, I wonder if God will give me an opportunity to share my story about how good God is. And you look at everyone, not as an obstacle, but an opportunity for you to share who Jesus is. That's chair three people. I can't look at, and it, it all, almost becomes an obsession because at the end of the day, let's just have real talk. If heaven and hell are real, which I believe they are, then man, people's lives depend on you stepping out of the comfort zone, going into the danger zone, and having conversations about how God has moved in your life, and if he did it for you, he could do it for them. But we have to be willing to have conversations, sharing our story. Are you sharing your, do you have a story? Or are you still maybe in chair two? But if you're in chair three, man, you're just not the same. There is no way that you can be walking with Jesus and be the same. God is changing you. Number one, you're sharing your story if you're in chair three. Number two, you're serving. Jesus said, I've come not to be served, but to serve others. Spiritually mature people at some point realize this is not about what I can get, but rather what I can give. It's not about what I can take, but rather what I can do with my life to serve other people. Spiritually mature people get off of the sidelines. They're not simply fans. Now they are full tilt followers in the game, serving, making church happen so we can set the table so those far from God can come and have the bread of life. We are serving. Are you serving? Or are you still saying, man, it's inconvenient. I just don't really have the time. You'll never have the time. You have to make decisions and prioritize differently if you're going to get in the game and serve. Here's the third thing. Spiritually mature people give. No way around it. I can tell where you're at in your faith right now by looking at your wallet. Oh, it got quiet, didn't it? Spiritual, listen to what I'm saying. Spiritually mature people go all in financially because you realize there is no better investment with your finances than investing in the kingdom of God so other people can come to know Christ. Sadly, man, 
20% of the people pick up 80% of the freight. You know what that's like? Having a meal and walking the check. You have a great meal, then you just kind of walk out. Somebody else will pick up the tab. No, spiritually mature people. Listen, Linda and I, we're one of the top givers in this church. And I'm not saying that boastfully. That's sad. Because a lot of you make way more than we do. But we've decided the greatest investment is not in our house. It's not in our bank account. It's not in a car. All those things go away. It's not in this dream, this entrepreneurial dream. Oh, we want to do this. We want to do this. I'm going to invest in this. The greatest investment that we have is right here in this church. That's what, that's, look at our bank account. Because this is the only thing that won't go away. So spiritually mature people are giving, man. They're, they're giving it. They're laying it on the line. Sacrificially giving. Because their heart has been changed, they realize life is not about what you can accumulate, but what you can give. And there's no better place. Listen, United Way is great, but that's not the church. The United Way will be gone. The church is the only thing that will be standing years from now. That's the only thing. So spiritually mature people, they do those three things. Now, there's a couple other chairs that we have to be careful of. There's the... High chair, which I call the my chair. You have to be careful of the my chair because it's so easy to slip into the my chair where it's about me, 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 my, 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 I, 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 I. See, there are people that think they're spiritually mature, but they're sitting in the my chair and they're saying, feed me, feed me, pastor, you got to feed me. Well, I would say this, if I invite you to my home, I'm gonna have food on the table, but at some point you have to pick up the fork and put it in your own mouth. So when you come to this church and you're going, feed me, feed me, feed me, I wanna remind you that there is a diner that's open 24 seven that you have full access to and it's called the Bible and at some point you've gotta to learn to pick it up, open it up, and feed yourself. One person, amen. You got to feed yourself, man. I can't always be running around because watch, if you're crying, don't miss this. If you're crying and I'm going, oh, don't cry. Don't, don't leave. Stay, stay. I've just turned my back on the rest of the table. I can't do it. I can't do it. So there's the my chair. And then... Maybe the deadliest of all. The lazy boy. I don't want to get up for church. This is so comfortable. Man, it feels good here, doesn't it? I could just stay here. You know, I'm, I'm, I know Jesus. I'm good. I know him. It's, I can't get to church. You know, my kids have wrestling, man. My kids have all of this stuff. I know Jesus. I'm going to stay here on the lazy boy where I can just hang out. I have other things. Pastor, you don't understand. There are so many things happening in my life. I have young kids. They're running everywhere. I got to do. It's Sunday, fun day. I'm staying on the lazy boy. I'm good. There's no chair that the devil wants you to stay in more than the lazy boy. This is the chair that the enemy wants you to become a couch potato. Just make excuses why you can't. Let me just say this. If you're here and you say, man, I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus, but you're not regular in this place, I'm going to challenge you. How can you be, if you're a spiritually mature person, how can you be bringing someone if you're not showing up yourself? It's not just about you. I love you. Linda and I want to do all that we can to serve you and your family. I, I want you to know that you are prayed for every day. Every day. Listen to what I'm saying. Will, every day. 
every day. Look, every day. I don't know all of your names, but I'm praying for you. I'm praying for your family. I'm praying for you. But you got to show up to grow up. You can't be in this, this I'm going to show up when it's convenient. Listen, God's got a better plan for your life, and God wants to use you to depopulate hell. And at some point, you got to say, man, I'm going to do whatever i got to do. I'm going to get to the house. I'm going to sit at the table. My life is going to be changed, and I'm going to change the world. TE Church is on a rescue mission. We're not just here hanging out on the weekend. We are on a rescue mission for God so that broken people, people far from God can come, man, sit at the table. And have the bread of life. At the beginning of this talk, I talked about highs and lows. I don't know what your high is today. Maybe you're at a great place. Maybe things are going really well in your world today. And if it is, when you're at this table, we're celebrating with you. We are high-fiving you. We are hugging you. We are loving you. We are encouraging you. But I want you to know that this is a table where it's okay to cry. This is a table where it's okay not to be okay. And maybe that's where you're at today. You're here, but there's something going on in your life that's too big for you. Jesus, right now, and I don't know who this is for, Jesus is saying, I've got you. Come to me. You'll never be hungry again. There are people in the church that are ready to play musical chairs. Today's your day to move up at the table. Let's pray together, every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, thank you for an opportunity to be in your house with your people at the table.